Guy Guthridge, for those I have not met yet, I spent the bulk of my career in the National Science Foundation's Antarctic program, the United States Antarctic program, and I was doing, doing mainly uh, outreach uh, of scientific information from the Antarctic to other scientists, but also information generally about the Antarctic to a broader audience using artists, writers, painters, teachers, people who would associate with the research teams for some amount of time and come back and tell you about the Antarctic in their own special way. Today I'm going to talk about the one person who brought attention to Antarctica within the United States, both the United States government and the public, Richard Byrd. And Richard Byrd was an admiral in the United States Navy for much of his career, although you'll hear a bit of a complication about that. But at any rate, uh, he got America interested enough in Antarctica that we've had the leadership role that we have had for a number of decades. But I would ask you to consider this irony. Here is this one individual who did more than any other single person to bring the United States to its present position, if you will, uh, in the Antarctic, international collaboration and scientific research and other peaceful pursuits. And I think the irony is that he was not a scientist, he was not a diplomat, he was an admiral of the United States Navy. So I, I would just let that sink in a bit. Uh, here's Antarctica, a region that's bigger than Europe, far bigger than the Middle East, um, and yet we have peace throughout the Antarctic. No sovereign power has military fortifications there, as you've already heard uh, from Dave Bresnahan. And since the beginning of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959, no sailor or soldier has fired a hostile shot. So we can thank, we Americans anyway, thank Richard Byrd for starting us on this path. But there are lots of other reasons to acknowledge Byrd's uh, participation in the Antarctic. He was the person who really, in a large-scale way, introduced modern methods into Antarctic exploration and research. And these uh, include all of the areas I've listed here. I see that, I don't know, maybe if, you, uh, if you're up there, if you could slide the uh, image over just a wee bit, uh, we'll pick up the whole thing. But at any rate, uh, aviation, of course, he introduced mechanized surface transport, radio communications, both within Antarctica, among field parties, and also, think of this, in the 1920s, live radio shows from Antarctica to the USA that were broadcast nationwide. Fundraising, he was very good at undraising. Uh, that's really fundraising. And also uh, at, at public relations. And public relations was critical to his fundraising. And I'll cover all these things as I go through here. So you had Byrd in this transition period. Before him, you had the heroic age. And you've heard a lot about that uh, with Scott and others uh, making these heroic quests. And they were expeditionary groups that went into the Antarctic, stayed a while, and left. Uh, man hauling dogs, no outside, no communications with the outside world. Uh, and they managed to get an enormous amount of science done despite all those hardships. It's really impressive. Byrd introduced and was a part of this transition period in the 1920s and 1940s where he brought mechanized transport, air, radio, and um, the improved science methods that I've already mentioned. And this was a transition between that heroic age and the modern age of science where we have continuing, typically government-sponsored expeditions that aren't really expeditions so much as, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a long presence in the Antarctic. Uh, international cooperation is increasingly a part of what's going on. Uh, the research is quite sophisticated, not to mention expensive. Safety is a big feature of all modern programs in the Antarctic, as well as environmental stewardship. 
So here's a slide showing the, some of the highlights of Bird's career, and I'm going to show you this slide several times more as I go through the slide, just to kind of get us back to reference. Um, again, the first digits are missing. It's 1912, 1920, and so forth. Uh, but at any rate, um, many of us do think of the heroic age first uh, when we consider Antarctica, because the stories from that time are so dramatic and so well told. Uh, and today, maybe so much is going on uh, throughout a broad area in the Antarctic, it's, it is harder to focus on the heroic aspects of some of the things that people are doing today. But let's just stick with Bird here, and I think we really need to stretch our imaginations just a wee bit to appreciate his impact in his own time. Now here are a few words from one of Bird's two most uh, scholarly biographers, and this one was published just recently in 2008. I, I'll, I'm going to give you a list of books at the end. Here's what he said, there are no heroes now. Sorry. There are no heroes now. Our cynical, mistrustful age has no use for them, nor for adventuring, which all too often seems contrived, and in the case of amateurs on Mount Everest, foolhardy as well. NASA's lunar astronauts might have been the high priests of the right stuff, but they also were spam in a can. But in the years between the two world wars, when the 20th century was still young, and the Western public grasped at the last fragile tendrils of belief and hope left from the physical and moral wreckage of the Western Front, Great men performing valiant deeds in far-off exotic places could still set popular pulses pounding. For many years, Richard Evelyn Byrd stood above the rest, even Lindbergh. So, back to the highlights. Um, looking at this list, you've probably seen already that Polar or Antarctic really is not the most prominent um, theme throughout Bird's life. Rather, it's flight. And I'm going to go through this, but look at the, you know, throughout his career, you can see where aircraft were really what drove Bird. The uh, United States Postal Service did a nice job of covering this distinction between the heroic age or the earlier age and later. Here is a stamp, whatever postage cost 25 cents, I'm not sure when that was, I don't remember now, but Nathaniel Palmer came down, you've probably heard this story already, this ship will be exactly where Nathaniel Palmer did his sealing tomorrow, coming down to the Antarctic Peninsula. Charles Wilkes over here, again, one of the early expeditions before mechanized transport, surveyed 1,500 miles of coast over here. These are two Americans that did early work, and you're, of course, more familiar with Scott uh, at what is now McMurdo Station and reaching the South Pole. The other four stamps in this, uh, other two stamps in this four-stamp block are Bird with his aircraft flight in the 1920s, late 1920s. Another American, uh, Lincoln Ellsworth, who did roughly the same thing during Byrd's second expedition. So these stamps just kind of commemorate those four Americans. Why did Byrd have so much influence? You really have to look at his ancestry a bit to really understand how he came to be able to, to sway America's industrial and political leaders. He came from a long line of prosperous and influential Virginians who were accustomed to circulating among and influencing the people who controlled the country. The first bird on the list here, uh, okay, that's 1688, 1730. You've probably figured all this out by now. Um, the first bird uh, uh, who came here uh, um, set up, bought a lot of property uh, on the James River in Virginia. His son, William Bird II, built a plantation there, including which is called Westover Plantation. Both of these birds had an, a lot of money. 
there's the plantation. It stands today. Um, over here is a Westover door. And this is Westover Plantation, but that Westover door is the most recognized architectural feature in the United States, I am told. And so now, whenever you see a Westover door, you'll think of the Antarctic. <laughs> William Byrd II also founded the city of Richmond, Virginia, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, USA. And I can't resist showing you this picture of the Byrd Theater, built, named for William Byrd, along with the mighty Wurlitzer that on Saturday nights comes up out of the floor, organist plays for a half an hour, it goes back down on the floor, and then the movie starts. All because of William Byrd. Now we're moving to Winchester with this Byrd family. Uh, William Byrd uh, the fourth decided that things would be more, uh, uh, he'd, he'd make more money over there, which he did. His son, Richard Evelyn Bird, same name as the bird we're talking about, uh, became an attorney, and he married uh, a very prominent, uh, or a woman from a very prominent family named Eleanor Flood. And in 1888, uh, the topic of this day's lecture was born. Here's where he grew up. So what was growing up like there in Winchester? Richard had two brothers, Tom, and you guessed it, Harry. Richard was the middle one, so yeah, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Harry was really important. I'm gonna talk more about him in a moment. The backyard of this house had a garden and a stable for the boys' ponies. Richard's father, a Commonwealth's attorney, as I mentioned, uh, uh, had a practice in Winchester, but he also had a practice in Richmond, Virginia's capital city, as you now know. Service as a Commonwealth attorney brought in only a pittance, and the father often was paid in kind for his private work. So here is here are two sentences from another biographer that I think I think you'll enjoy. I certainly did. This biographer biography was done in 1968. They kept up a good front with servants and horses and private schools for the boys. But there was not much left over. Now, I'm sure you understand completely. I, I had to let two servants go just, just last year. <laughs> Theirs was a home of middle class respectability in which the values of honesty, modesty, obedience to authority, self-discipline, and gentlemanliness were taught. The boys were not saints. They had a gang they called the Western Gang, and Richard and Harry got into a brawl with the, the rival Potato Hill Gang. Harry was hit in the forehead by a rock. And here's, uh, here's a little bit of uh, information from the biographer. Dick was ready to kill the whole lot, but Harry, with blood dripping from his wound, pleaded with his brother to take him to the doctor where he received stitches that left a scar for the remainder of his life. Now remember the scar. If you go to Winchester, don't expect to find this house. Instead, what else? A used car lot. But here's the historical sign out front. And you don't need to read the whole sign, but uh, there is one sentence in here that uh, is intriguing. Byrd is regarded, regarded as the father of the Antarctic Peace Treaty. They, they got the name wrong. It's the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, many of us associated with Antarctic affairs think that sentence is stretching the truth a bit. Not because Byrd's contribution was not significant, but because so many other individuals and governments worked so hard together to bring the Antarctic Treaty into being. So back to Harry. Here we are down at the last line here. For four decades, from the 1920s until the 1960s, the bird who Virginians would figure you're talking about when you said bird was not Richard. It was Harry. He and Richard remained close throughout their lives, and Harry was not shy in and out of the United States Senate about advancing his brother Richard's objectives. 
Perry's stature was national. So I can't find the scar on this painting <laughs> on Time Magazine. But uh, by the time Harry became governor of Virginia in the late 1920s, he'd already made his fortune running Winchester's two newspapers and planting apples. He became a U.S. Senator in 1933 and was still one when this cover story came out 29 years later. He ruled Virginia for three decades. At the national level, he was an internationalist, consistent with Richard, and he supported Roosevelt's foreign policy, President Roosevelt. He was a political conservative, and he strongly favored, uh, Roosevelt strongly favored Byrd's Antarctic expeditions. So here's a really interesting aside. Uh, remember Dave's lectures two days ago about the Antarctic Treaty. Twelve nations had signed it in Washington. Then they all had to go home and get their governments to agree to it. And the way the United States does that is the Senate has to vote two-thirds majority to, uh, to, to ratify a treaty. So a vote was called in August of 1960 for the Senate to ratify the treaty so it could enter into force. Harry Byrd, along with 20 other United States senators, voted against it. And Richard Byrd had died three years early, but I would really like to know what Richard Byrd would have said about his brother's vote. So now here's, here's Byrd. I've, this is the slide I've, I've showed you before, and we're going to keep going through it. Uh, but there he is at the age of 12, visiting the Philippines without his parents. He was the guest of a relative uh, named Kit Carson, and uh, he wrote a lot about his experiences, and he wrote this in his diary. This is a 12-year-old kid. Judge Carson sentencing men to death and their acceptance of hanging without the quivering of an eyelid. He went to Shenandoah Military Academy, two years at VMI, then a year at University of Virginia. In the spring of 1908, he got the appointment he really wanted, which was to the Naval Academy, class of 1912. At the Academy, something happened to Byrd that would change his whole life. He was a gymnast. He was always committed to, to good being in good physical shape. He fell 13 feet doing some gym work and broke an ankle that he had already injured. And he was not the greatest scholar, but he did excel at math and at navigation. Um, but by 1916, after he became active duty Navy, uh, his, his uh, classmates were getting promoted and he was not getting promoted. And it was because he was crippled. Uh, so Ensign Bird, at 28 years old, requested and was required, retired from active duty. Now, I don't know how many of you are Navy or ex-Navy here. In those days, here he was with four years of active duty. He got three quarters pay for the rest of his life at the age of 28 years old. Five days later, though, he was appointed administrator of the Naval Militia of the state of Rhode Island as a retired officer on active duty. Sorry, I'm having troubles here. Uh, he was promoted to lieutenant, and then he went to Pensaco Pensacola Naval Air Station in Florida to organize things down there. And it turns out that Byrd was a brilliant organizer of people and institutions. He then, the next thing he did, here he is still a lieutenant commander, retired, and he shopped a bill to establish the Bureau of Aeronautics in the United States Navy uh, on Capitol Hill, and it passed. Now, some of you remembering military history know that Billy Mitchell of the Army was doing the same thing for the Army. So here's Byrd, and he kind of outstepped Billy Mitchell. Byrd also was very technically oriented, and he uh, worked with the National Geographic Society to create something called the Bumstead Sun Compass. At high latitudes, magnetic compasses do not work. 
So you've got to have something else if you're going to fly accurately in high latitudes. And this was the solution. It worked excellently. I'm not going to bother to explain how uh, it works, but it worked excellently if the sun was shining. Here's Berg using it in, an, in one of his uh, airplane flights. Just, you just hold it in your hand and sight across it, and that gives you your heading to the nearest degree. Here's somebody doing the equivalent today on an, in an LC-130. So, one of his first great polar achievements was to fly to the North Pole. And he did it from Spitsburg, and I'm going to show you where in just a second. But what Bird was doing was exploiting existing technology. He was not inventing things, like the sun compass. Somebody else put it together and he exploited it. Airplanes, he exploited it. So here's an interesting paragraph. He wrote, he wrote this on the 23rd of May, 1927, after this flight to the North Pole. We revealed no startling information to the world. We made no aeronautical records of altitude or duration. We did not even suffer any extraordinary hardships that might have meant an enthralling tale of hairbreadth escape nor can we so much as claim any great personal achievement. We simply took advantage of the knowledge gained by three centuries of Arctic heroes and applied our Navy training to aviation, that great science born in this country, and so added a short paragraph to the story of man's conquest of the globe on which we live. Now, Byrd had a lot of non-humble features. And he was so non-humble that he was really humble sometimes. I, that didn't come out just right, but, but Bird did a lot of bragging about himself, is what I'm trying to say. So don't forget that it was real. this was a very difficult technical achievement, flying the 814 miles from Svalbard up to the North Pole and back without stopping, including all of the navigation that had to be done. Um, but many of you know about the controversy uh, that Bird may or may not have gotten to the North Pole on this flight. And I would just read you something that just came out last year. That his papers have now become fully available. And uh, here's, here's what... Um, a person named Gerald Newsom, Professor Emeritus of Astronomy at Ohio State, wrote after researching Bird's private papers, that they returned at all is a major accomplishment, and the fact that they arrived back where they were supposed to, that shows that Bird knew how to navigate with his solar compass correctly. And since the plane was theoretically high enough to see nearly 90 miles to the horizon, Bird may not have reached the pole, but even in the worst case scenario, he almost certainly saw it through his cockpit window. And there is the plane that he used. It's now on display at the Ford Museum in Michigan, a, a, a Fokker trimotor. Another flight that he performed, uh, this one across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, remember, Lindbergh, just a couple of months ago, had made his very famous solo flight across the Atlantic. And Bird was heroic, or celebrated in the papers for this flight. What's the difference? Bird was using a multi-engine plane. He had a contract from the post office to deliver the mail. And what he was trying to demonstrate was the practical uses of airplanes, rather than the heroic uses of airplanes. Um, it, it was not a it was not a great trip. They 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 got to Paris. It was fogged in. They couldn't land. They flew back to the ocean, uh, which was the only place they could put the airplane down. They crash landed uh, just off the coast and swam ashore. The airplane was lost. Uh, Thirty eight hundred miles all told, and of course headlines proclaiming his success the next day. 
This is another Time Magazine cover I'm showing you. I think it's interesting that he made Time Magazine's cover before his first Antarctic expedition even got started. And it included a what, what you have to call a stunt, flying an airplane from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole and back without stopping. But it also included a lot of excellent scientific research throughout much of West Antarctica. Here is uh, one of their ships. They had more than one uh, at the ice edge in, uh, in the Antarctic, uh, at where Little America was being built. And I am going to read another paragraph here, uh, because it shows or helps to show Byrd's influence and how he exercised it. The time is September 1928. Most of the first Antarctic expedition has gotten underway from ports in the United States. It's a private expedition, not a Navy or a government one. Byrd's status is Commander, U.S. Navy, retired. He's 39 years old. He's done all the planning, raised the money, he thought, and uh, this is the first major modern expedition in the history of Antarctic exploration. So his accountant pulls him aside. He says, the expedition is $300,000 short. That was real money in those days. And five, in five days, Bird worked the telephones and raises $100,000, a third of what's needed. Uh, but if they don't get the rest, they're not going to be able to continue on down into the Antarctic. So here's what I want to read to you. So the Bird Aviation Associates was formed in October 1928, the chairman being Charles Evans Hughes, perhaps the most respected figure in the United States. Hughes had been a candidate for president, secretary of state, and chief justice of the United States Supreme Court, no more impressive man could be name could be found anywhere. If the Byrd expedition was not a government e enterprise, and it was not, it could not have had more prestige than with that figure as the head of the committee. The other names are also impressive. Vincent Astor, Bernard Bern Baruch, Harry Guggenheim, Otto Kahn, Joseph Pulitzer, there's a total of 15 of them. All these men lent their names to the committee that would raise the funds and get the Bird Expedition out of debt, which they did. I mean, consider this achievement. Working the phones and forming a committee in a few days and raising 300000 So the anecdote gives a sense of Bird's intense passion, focus, and commitment to completing his goals. Here's Little America, which they set up right on uh, very near the coast of the Ross Ice Shelf, near the, what's called the Bay of Wales. And I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Um, these, all these Little Americas, there were five of them over the course of uh, a couple of decades, were on a floating ice shelf that was continually going out to sea and breaking off. So this is Little America Three, which came along in the early 1940s that a ship passing by just happened to catch a picture of um, uh, as, as it was getting ready to calve off. The same thing happened to Little America I and Little America II. Um, on the 29th of November 2004, the National Science Foundation commemorated that first flight of Bird to the South Pole in 1929, uh, which we'll get to in a sec, uh, by flying over where Little America had been. And it's now, or it, it was then, water. Here's the camp, seen from the ground. Radio antennas were a big part of it, as I've already covered, and plenty of supplies. Here is the Ford tri-motor airplane that Bird flew to the South Pole. And this is a view from the airplane crossing over the Trans-Antarctic Mountains on the way to the pole. Now, 
again, this was nothing, uh, this is not a routine flight. To get yeah. well into middle age, Richard Byrd was still doing one-arm chin-ups. He was a hero on various levels. Once he was standing on the fantail of the ship, the one I showed you, when it was unloading supplies onto the Ross ice shelf in the Antarctic, a man fell in the water. And here it is, 29 degree water. Bird, here he was, the leader of the expedition, without hesitation, dove in and rescued the man. So you might not have liked him, but it's kind of a good leader to have. This kind of a picture these days does not, does not win you much influence in Washington, I, I would imagine. Uh, but this was a different time. Here is a more conventional portrait. This is Byrd at the, uh, on the front steps of 9 Brimmer Street, the house he had most of his professional life in Boston, Massachusetts, along with his wife Marie, his son Richard E. Byrd, Jr. Uh, and three daughters. And Bird, Bird knew how to schmooze it up. He enjoyed the good life onto whose lower rungs he had been born as a certifiable Virginia gentleman. And he came to revere business and those businessmen who so materially aided him over the years as the exemplifications of American greatness and can-do progress. Among his closest friends, were the titans of American enterprise. They, in turn, revered him for his organizational skills and fiscal integrity in mounting his great South Polar expeditions. So that's the first expedition. The second expedition, now think about this. The first expedition, he raised the money in 1928. The stock market was booming. Money was everywhere. The second expedition took place in the early 30s, really starting in around 1932, in the very depths of the Great Depression. And yet, Byrd got the money. It's really impressive he pulled this off. Remember, he had the stunt of flying to the South Pole in the first expedition. The stunt this time was he left everybody but himself on the coast at Little America II this time. Uh, and he wintered alone, he spent part of the winter alone uh, in 1934 at a place called he called Advance Base, which is about 110 miles inland. And here's a mock-up of it that's in the uh, Navy Museum in Washington. You can go see it today. The U.S. Antarctic program would, would, would never countenance something like this, one person 100 miles away in the middle of winter. And in fact, in about halfway through the winter, uh, his stove malfunctioned, he got carbon monoxide poisoning, he sent out these, I'm doing great emails, uh, emails, sure. <laughs> radio Morse messages back to Little America, but they got so quirky that the guys knew something was wrong. So they went out with tractors, saved his life by rescuing him and brought him back. Well, here he was a rear admiral in the United States Navy. And, and he, he's alone, he makes his own meals, he reads a book for company, he doesn't have a haircut, he's, he's like this overachieving hippie. <laughs> and and he, it, makes, it makes you want to like him in a way, but the Navy did not like him much after this. Uh, they don't like rear admirals behaving this way. The last paragraph of one of his books, some people call it his best book, it's called Alone, uh, talks about this winter he, he spent, and he says this, Before I close this story of advanced base, I must mention one more thing I learned as a result of what happened to me there. Eager as I was to step directly into the responsibilities of leadership on my return to Little America, I was not long in discovering that a few were beyond me. And for example, they were doing some flights out to the Rockefeller Mountains and Bird wanted to be in charge. Uh, and so, but he wasn't, he just didn't take over. And so this is back to his book, 
So I say in conclusion, a man doesn't begin to attain wisdom until he recognizes that he is no longer indispensable. So that's the very last paragraph of this book, Alone. In a way, we could end the story there of Richard Byrd, um, but just so that we can see the fullness of his legacy, I'd like to do a final chapter. <laughs> Byrd, uh, in terms of the Navy, was kicked upstairs. He became officer in charge of three succeeding expeditions that would never have got going, would never have got funding from Congress were it not for the name Richard E. Byrd. But the thing that the Navy did most vociferously was to make sure he was not in charge. And they did that by making him officer in charge. <laughs> so the admirals below him were really running the place. And this included the U.S. Arctic Service, which was the first U.S. government expedition. Uh, it was supposed to be continuous, but World War II got in the way. Operation High Jump using uh, surplus uh, military or leftover military equipment was the largest expedition ever made to the Antarctic. Here's a picture. They had an aircraft carrier. They had a submarine, planes galore. Did a lot of good work. International Geophysical Year, which you've heard about already, uh, Byrd was a major impetus for it in name. And they actually took him along, uh, but the officers, Navy officers, were actually rude to him. Uh, on more than one occasion. So he learned that he was no longer indispensable. During World War II, though, Byrd uh, had a really interesting assignment and probably fun. He was sent all over the South Pacific scouting out potential airfields for the Navy to use uh, during during the war, and he, he was quite successful at this, uh, sending back good final reports and so forth. And I want to show you a little offshoot here. This is a letter that he wrote to his buddy Franklin in the White House. Uh, Bird, Bird every year for years would send the boxes of apples to hundreds of his friends, including his good buddy Franklin, Franklin's secretary, and many, many others, uh, heads of corporations. These boxes of apples, always with a typed letter like this that said Merry Christmas or whatever it was. But, but this, is, this is sort of typical in a way. Uh, it's the middle of World War II. Franklin Roosevelt may have other things on his mind. Hey, I got a first stamp issue cover of Pitcairn. And he also um, mentions uh, down here that, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, more rare stamps. He does say something about what his job was. They've investigated 21 islands, surveyed 10. We did it quickly because we prepared very thoroughly for the job. Um, he, self, self congratulations uh, were always a part of what he did, despite that modesty I mentioned earlier. Um, and almost as a sign, an aside, we lost 24 men from an explosion. Um, and uh, here's a handwritten note. I know you can't read that. It says, many, and this is his second self congratulations. Many of the islands have no harbor even for small boats. We have to ride the surf to shore. My experience with this has been helpful. Dick. Well, I guess all of us end up this way one way or another, but uh, it's just kind of poignant to see that this is a government issue tombstone at Arlington National Cemetery. He received the Medal, on Medal of Honor for his North Pole flight, not for anything he did in the Antarctic. And as usual, the decision to award the medal did not come up through the Navy chain of command. It was a direct result of an act of Congress. So here is a, an author who is not a biographer of Byrd. 
he wrote a, an, a book called Eagle Over the Ice, which basically describes the achievements of the United States in the Antarctic. But the man who dominated Antarctic activities during the interwar period was Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who led five successive Antarctic expeditions beginning with that of 1928-30. His expeditions were largely responsible for spurring the U.S. government to become actively involved in Antarctic politics. They also demonstrated the feasibility of sustained operations on the continent and ushered in the concept of modern exploration that have led Americans to nearly every part of the continent. These are his four books, Bird's four books. The first one describes his, uh, the earlier part of his career when he was so heavily involved in promoting uh, aviation in the United States Navy. Little America is the book about the first Antarctic expedition, Little America One. This is the second Antarctic expedition, and this is the book I've already mentioned alone uh, from which I read a paragraph. And then here are his two bi biographies. Uh, one published in 1968, which was not able to take advantage of all the bird papers, and the uh, author said the definitive biography, biography can be written when we get all those papers, and here is that biography published 40 years later uh, using the papers, all of Bird's papers. The Navy has let up a bit uh, and named a ship after Bird in 2007. Here is Bird's daughter, uh, Bowling Bird Clark. Her two daughters, uh, na two Navy personnel and two contractor personnel. I do not know the identity of the girl in front. But Bird himself might be proudest of this in terms of legacy. The Bird Polar Research Center at Ohio State University, which is very, very prominent in performing scientific research in the Antarctic today, and has all of the Richard E. Byrd papers taken from that Nine Brimmer Street address. So I'm, I'm going to uh, get through this pretty quickly here, but um, not just Americans appreciate Byrd. Here is the, uh, a Norwegian who at the time was the head of the International Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, uh, praising uh, Byrd. The United States has in many ways been a leading candidate ever since Byrd started his expeditions. And here is a statue of Byrd at McMurdo Station with a reference to his thoughts regarding international collaboration in the Antarctic. And my last slide simply states what I think Byrd always would have thought should be U.S. policy for the Antarctic. The Antarctic is the only continent where science serves as the principal expression of national policy and interest, a statement that was issued by the White House in 1970. So that's my real quick summary of Richard E. Byrd. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you uh, have a good afternoon and maybe no more lunch.